Uh, Robbie George, I think most of you know him or know who he is. You should if you don't. Um, I want to say a few things about Robbie. Um, you can read about his bio here. It's a very, very impressive, uh, uh, formidable list of honors and achievements. Um, I had a great privilege to be here for a year, about five years ago, and there was an event on campus uh, involving a debate on same-sex marriage between Robbie and someone else. And this debate was hosted by a group that would uh, likely be not on Robbie's side on this issue. And so it was maybe my first week here, I thought, I got, I got to see this. How, how do you do this? How do you come into a place like Princeton University and make this argument and not get assaulted with, you know, at best tomatoes, rotten tomatoes, at worst, who knows? You know, how, how does one do this? And so I went and it was, I, I can't tell you how he did it exactly, but with this sort of characteristic charm that you're gonna see in just a moment, uh, and friendliness and generosity, combined with a truth-telling, that, that was the amazing thing, uh, he got somehow the, all of the attention in the room directed to the opponent in the debate, so that this whole room was comprised of people that were all in favor of same-sex marriage. Um, and so I thought they were gonna come at Robbie, but Robbie re redirected the question to his opponent, and suddenly they began, at, began attacking him, uh, that he was not uh, pure enough on the marriage debate. And I, Robbie just kind of looked over, yeah, so what is your answer to that? And I don't think they asked him, Robbie many questions. So just the whole room became divided and factious, and it was a beautiful thing to see. Um, uh, Robbie, uh, if you don't know, is... Um, a talented musician. This is something I love about him. He, he could have gone the way of uh, Earl Scruggs or, or better, um, but he didn't, so he's here with us. Um, but uh, he, he's a great musician. Someone told me once uh, when I was here five years ago that Robbie was giving a lecture. I think it was maybe even in the Makash room that we were in last night. That huge lecture room was filled. And a student came in in a clown costume uh, and walked up on the stage. Robbie was standing at the microphone with two banjos. And he handed Robbie a banjo. And then he started playing dueling banjos. And they played back and forth. And Robbie won, I think. I don't know how that duel went. But uh, did no one catch this on film anywhere? Because everyone was talking about it. But if we could have a recording of that, it would be wonderful. The, the main thing here is that, is that Robbie holds the McCormick Professor, the cha he's the Robert P, I'm sorry, he's the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence here at Princeton. And the famous uh, person, other person, most famous other person who held this chair uh, was Woodrow Wilson, uh, who went on from that chair to become uh, President of the United States. Uh, would that this would be a precedent for Robbie George. Uh, that's all I will say about politics right now, uh, but um, please give a warm round of applause to Robbie George. Well, thank you so much, Professor Schlater, uh, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, the event with the dueling banjos happened in this very room. Uh, he entered from, I, I was looking up at my class uh, from this direction and he entered from uh, that door. We had a lot of fun playing dueling banjos. Uh, after um, 31 years uh, in uh, academic life, and you don't need me to tell you what academic life is like these days, uh, I've sometimes um, wondered why I didn't go the route of professional banjo playing and, and gone into a respectable, uh, respectable profession. Uh, but here I am and here you are and I want to congratulate you for uh, being here. Uh, the fact that you're here uh, says uh, that you are ready, willing and able uh, to fight for what's good, to fight for what's right, to stand up for the most beautiful and important institution of all, the institution of marriage, to stand up for the family, to stand up for sexual integrity, 
without which we simply cannot have a healthy, flourishing, vibrant uh, marriage culture. You don't need me to tell you that the institution of marriage is badly wounded. And with it, our society is very deeply uh, wounded. But your being here says that you're willing to try to do something about that. And if you're willing to try, you will succeed. The one virtue beyond a sound understanding of marriage itself, the one virtue that is needed is the virtue of, the virtue of courage. And courage is in short supply. But you're here, and that tells me that you've got that virtue as well. I only have a very short time with you today because I have to run to the airport to head off to, uh, to England, uh, uh, going on an overnight flight uh, this evening. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, that I have with you, first just to congratulate you uh, on uh, your fidelity to this great cause uh, and, to, uh, uh, and for your courage, uh, and to congratulate uh, Caitlin and Brittany and everybody, Lisa, everyone at Love and Fidelity uh, Network. Uh, for continuing uh, to hold these conferences to help to inform and encourage uh, our young people who will make the difference, who will turn this uh, thing around. And Nathan, th Nathan, thank you very much for, uh, for being here and for emceeing um, this event. It's really great to have you back uh, uh, in Princeton. Welcome. I hope you'll come often. So with the few minutes that I have, I just wanted to go to the foundational question. All of your witness and all of your work, no matter how practical it is, will rest on a sound theoretical understanding of marriage. And it's absolutely critical that you have that. It is not good enough today. It would have been good enough a generation ago. It would have been good enough for most of human history. But today it's not good enough to just have a kind of feeling about what marriage is or a kind of deep intuitive sense of what marriage is. Because marriage is so deeply under assault in theory as well as in practice, you've got to actually know what it is and be able to articulate an understanding of what it is. Now to get there, perhaps it's best to begin by explaining what it isn't. And what it isn't is what most of your peers and most of my peers think it is. They think that marriage is a socially constructed institution that essentially, essentially recognizes sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. That's it. People form romantic bonds because people are attracted to each other. There's a sexual dimension to that attraction, but sex doesn't mean male and female. Sex means a kind of erotic desire. It's good for them to form these bonds because they find these bonds psychologically fulfilling. And at the end of the day, our peers basically believe value consists in and only in, certainly ultimately in, psychic satisfaction. And therefore, we have good reason, and the state has good reason, and all other institutions have good reason to recognize these bonds. These bonds are in no way inherently connected to procreation and the rearing of children. That's simply incidental. Some married people like that sort of thing and go in for it. Others don't. The relationship, if any, is purely contingent. On this understanding of marriage as essentially sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership, marriage differs from other forms of friendship, other types of affectionate relationships only in degree of emotional intensity. It's not different in kind from other types of friendship. Marriage is, in the words of one of the most articulate and intelligent defenders of same-sex marriage, marriage is your relationship with your number one person. There I'm quoting 
the philosopher John Corvino. Your relationship with your number one person. That sums up the idea of marriage as sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership, differing from other relationships only in degree of emotional intensity. It's your number one relation as opposed to your number two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. That, my friends, is what marriage is not. It can't possibly be that. Because if it were that, not only would we be unable to explain why marriage is the union of man and woman, which is the very thing, of course, that's in dispute now, but we would not be able to dis explain many other things that our friends who defend that conception of marriage tell us they don't want to dispute, like the idea that marriage is a partnership of two and only two people, not three or four or five in polyamorous ensembles. Or why marriages should be closed sexually rather than open. That could be defended on the sexual romantic companionship view of marriage only as a matter of contingent subjective preference. There could be no principled basis why two partners in marriage, or three or four, however many there are, could not have their relationship be a sexually open one. Different strokes for different folks, whatever you happen to like. Nor can this understanding explain why marriage should be a permanent bond, or at least a bond pledged to permanence, as opposed to a contract for a period of time, let's say five years, renewable if the marriage partners decide that they liked the first term. None of that can be explained. None of the traditional understandings or traditional marks or incidents of marriage can be explained on the sexual romantic companionship idea. But unless you adopt that idea, there is no way you can justify the idea of marriage between same-sex partners. So if that's what marriage is not, what is marriage? First, let's look at it from the point of view of society. Let's look at marriage, in other words, as a social institution, then we'll dig deeper from there. Understood as a social institution, marriage is the relationship that unites a man and a woman as husband and wife to be father and mother to any children born of that union. Human beings noticed a long time ago that when you put men and women, males and females, together in a place for a period of time, babies start arriving. And all societies make some arrangements, some have some understanding of what needs to be in place. And the marriage idea is the idea that there should be a social institution recognized as uniting a man and a woman, as husband and wife, to be father and mother to any children born of their union, thus conferring upon those children, those precious little ones, the inestimable blessing of being brought up in the bond, ideally the bond of love and commitment, between their biological progenitors, between the man and woman, now mother, father and mother, whose union brought them into being, and giving them the additional and indispensable benefit of both paternal and maternal care and influence. So the little boy in growing up will have a father who models for him what it means to be a man, who models for him what it means to be a protector rather than a predator so that he will grow up to be a protector and not, as so many little boys grow up today to be, a 
predator. So that a little girl born into that family will have not only a mother modeling for her what it means to be a woman, but will have a father in a position to show her how a good man treats a woman, teaching her to expect and demand from any man who wants her attention, affection, and favor, to expect and demand treatment with dignity, treatment as an equal, treatment with respect. This, my friends, is why marriage matters to society at all and why, far from being a merely private arrangement, law and the state across cultures and throughout history have recognized and regulated the marital bond. The libertarian fantasy that marriage can be privatized overlooks the profound truth that marriage is of key importance to the well-being of society and the sub-communities within any society constituting that society. But it's important for the reasons I just articulated that a society not just settle for any old view of what marriage is, that in recognizing marriage it recognize marriage. No quotation marks around it. The real thing. Marriage reality. Now let's dig deeper. What is marriage? We understand why societies care about it. We understand why they need to get the real thing and not some faux version of marriage, not some phony, fake idea of marriage. Marriage is the type of relationship that is naturally ordered to and would be fulfilled by the spouses having and rearing children together. Now notice that nothing in that definition of marriage, nothing in that understanding of marriage, suggests that the value and point of marriage is reducible to its utility or instrumental significance for the project of child rearing. Critics of the conjugal understanding of marriage, the idea I'm articulating of marriage as a conjugal union, go off the rails even in their criticism of so-called traditional marriage, of conjugal marriage, because they mistakenly attribute to us the view that the value of marriage is merely instrumental to procreation. And then you, you see how the, how the argument goes from there. Well, look, if marriage is just valuable because it's instrumental to procreation, then how can you let sterile opposite sex couples marry, like elderly people when the woman is past uh, childbearing age? Gotcha! except don't gotcha, because don't understand. Often because refuse to understand, often because don't want to understand, don't want to understand because don't want to face the reality undermining their conception of marriage as mere sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. No, the value of marriage is fundamentally intrinsic and not instrumental even though marriage does have profound instrumental value of the sort I articulated when I invited you to look at marriage from the point of view of its contribution to society. But what has intrinsic value is marriage itself. That is, it's intrinsically worthwhile, intrinsically humanly fulfilling, for a man and woman, 
forming the bond of husband and wife, to enter into precisely the type of relationship that is ordered to and would naturally be fulfilled by them having and rearing children together. And that value is realized in their lives with all of its incidental and intrinsic contributions and, uh, and instrumental uh, contributions to society simply by entering into that bond and living up to the requirements and exemplifying the virtues needed to live in that bond. So living up to fidelity, exhibiting the virtue of chastity. By living the married life, as I just described it, the couple fulfill each other, fulfill themselves in this crucial respect of their humanity. And they gain that value, they realize that value, that intrinsic value, whether or not they are in fact able to have children. So an elderly couple in which the wife is beyond child rearing or the husband happens to be naturally sterile or uh, has, uh, has uh, lost the capacity uh, to have children, still they have entered into precisely the type of relationship that is ordered to and naturally would be fulfilled by their having and rearing children together. Now let's go even deeper. What's behind that? On the sexual romantic companionship view of marriage, marriage is because it can only be a bond at the psychic or emotional level. What is marriage? Marriage is your most intense relationship, your most emotionally intense, or your relationship with your number one person, where number one has to do with your emotions, your attitude toward that person. But that can't be what marriage actually is if we dig deeper. For marriage is not merely an emotional bond. Marriage is a comprehensive union of persons, uniting persons not only in one respect of their being, the emotive or affective or psychic, but in the entire range of one's being, the bodily, biological, the emotive, to be sure, the rational, dispositional, the spiritual. A man and woman in marriage are united in all of those respects, but their relationship is unique as a marriage because it is founded upon the thing made possible by sexual reproductive complementarity, and that is true bodily union. True bodily union. Our friends on the other side can't understand why for all of history in our society, not just in terms of the uh, view of the church, but also the state, why consummation of marriage should matter. Why was a marriage considered incomplete unless it was consummated? Why did sex matter? And the particular type of sex that fulfills the behavioral conditions of procreation? And why, when a couple on the wedding night or whenever they got round to it, fulfilled the behavioral conditions of procreation, why did that count as consummation, perfecting, completing the marriage, rendering it non-annullable, even if no baby was conceived, even if the non-behavioral conditions of procreation happened not to obtain? It's because union at the bodily level is not just union of two subpersonal instruments of psyches or spirits or souls inhabiting bodies, but rather is the actual union of persons. And where our bodily union is chosen by the husband and wife as the foundation and matrix of their complete sharing of life, their comprehensive sharing of life, sharing not only at the biological level, but at the emotional, rational disposition, dispositional, even spiritual, where, in other words, that all happens, you've got a conjugal relationship, a conjugal bond. That's what marriage actually is, a comprehensive sharing of life founded upon the biological union made possible by sexual reproductive complementarity. You don't get bodily union by running, by rubbing limbs or organs together. 
you get bodily union by completing a whole, where the whole can only be completed by the cooperative action of the two spouses. And that matters. I knew, even uh, as a young person when I was uh, the age of some of you, back when the sexual revolution was just getting underway, I knew that at the end of the day, it would fall to our side to defend the dignity and importance of sex. And here we are. We can give an account of why it matters. The other side simply can't, because you notice that on the sexual reproductive complement, uh, sexual reproductive, uh, uh, sorry, sexual uh, romantic conception of marriage, the domestic partnership conception of marriage, not only are, is procreation merely incidental, so is sex. If you happen not to go in for that kind of thing, just as you can have sex without marriage, you can have marriage without sex. Consummation doesn't matter at all. But on the conjugal understanding of marriage, it truly does. Our sexuality is part of ourselves. It's part of our personal reality. And just the final point to wrap it all up. Notice that you will come down one way or another on the issue of whether biological unity is capable of providing the foundation and matrix for a comprehensive sharing of life, marriage, depending on what you think the person is. So the answer to the question, what is marriage, is ultimately rooted in the question, what is a person? If you believe that a person is a psyche inhabiting a body, if you believe that we are ghosts in machines, if you believe that the real person is the mental substance and the material is just the body, is just the material vehicle to be used by the real person, the psyche, as an extrinsic instrument, then the best you're going to be able to do is some sort of understanding of marriage, now in quotation marks, as uh, the socially constructed institution we get when we recognize sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. But if you reject that Gnostic understanding of what persons are, in favor of the view that a person is a dynamic unity of body, mind, and spirit, that our bodies are not mere subpersonal instruments to be used by ourselves, considered as the conscious and desiring part of the self. If you understand that the body is part of our personal reality, then bodily union of the sort made possible by sexual reproductive complementarity is indeed personal union. And when it is chosen precisely as the foundation and matrix of the marital bond, it is of the essence of marriage itself. So you can see that whatever Hollywood celebrities may say, whatever university professors may say, there's a very deep philosophical difference between the two schools of thought. And looked at purely from the point of view of rationality, purely from the point of view of philosophy, even factoring out the biblical witness, even factoring out religious authority, factoring out anything but the question on the merits on the plane of reason, I sure wouldn't want to be in the position of defending marriage as mere sexual romantic companionship underwritten by a view of the human person as a ghost in a machine. Thank you.
Hello, thank you so much for the talk. My name is Joseph Gazai. I am a student at Providence College. And I was wondering if you could talk about the last question, what is a person? And how can we take that question and that understanding, the answer to that question, into the debate about marriage? Oh, okay. Uh... Everyone agrees that marriage unites two people, right? Well, some people think it can be more than two people. But everyone agrees that marriage unites people, unites persons. Except for a few really cringy characters, nobody believes that uh, you can marry a cat or that you can marry the, marry the Eiffel Tower. There is a woman who claims she married the Eiffel Tower, but that's a cringe position. So everyone agrees that marriage is a union of persons. Well, then the next question I think to invite our interlocutor to consider is, well then, what do you mean by a person? What gets united? And you can grant to your interlocutor that if what ultimately matters, what the person is, is the mind or psyche or center of consciousness and feeling, if that's what a person is, then yeah, two persons of the same sex, since bodies don't matter, so, so two genderless spirits uh, can unite and that can be a marriage. Whether they happen to be inhabiting male bodies or inhabiting female bodies. But then you invite your interlocutor to consider whether you really want to tie yourself to the idea that the person is a genderless spirit that inhabits a gendered body. Does that, does that work? Does that make sense? Are we, in fact, ghosts and machines? That one you pull out yourself. Not to look something up, but to hold it up. Okay? Now, everybody is perceiving this, right? But you're not perceiving it the way a dog or a raccoon, or even a really smart animal like a pig, turns out pigs are really smart, <laughs> is perceiving it. You're doing something else. You're not just perceiving something. What else are you doing? You're understanding it. You're understanding it by applying a universal concept. Cell phone. You understand that this is not my checkbook. My last will and testament. An elephant. Now, are two separate things perceiving and understanding here? So is one thing, namely your body, perceiving, and another thing, namely your mind, understanding? Or is the thing that's both perceiving and understanding a unified thing, namely you. The person as a unified reality. Well, if you think about that for very long, you're going to realize it's got to be the unified thing, you. This is, this is what blasts apart at the end of the day, what philosophers call substance dualism. Uh, the Cartesian position, uh, or the Gnostic position, that we are personal, uh, non-bodily persons inhabiting and using non-personal bodies. If it were otherwise, you'd never be able to explain the relationship, the communication between the biological thing doing the perceiving and the mental thing doing the understanding. So at the end of the day, that can't be. Which takes us to the judgment that the body is not subpersonal. It's not a mere instrument of the person. It's part of the personal reality of the human being. But if that's true, then what does a comprehensive uniting of persons constitute? What, what, if marriage is a uniting of persons, a comprehensive, uniquely uh, uh, a distinctive uniting of persons because of its comprehensiveness, what's the person? It's got to be unity at the bodily level and not just at the affective or emotional level. And this, by the way, enables me to wrap up a point that I should have wrapped up in my uh, opening remarks. 
If that's true, then you've got an explanation for what is distinctive about marriage. It's not what our friends on the other side think it is, that it's just the same kind of thing as an ordinary friendship, only more emotionally intense. You're a number one person. What's distinctive about it is that it's founded on bodily unity. Unlike your relationship, I hope, with your professors. Unlike your relationship with your mother. Unlike your relationship with your siblings. <coughs> unlike your relationships with your friends, your ordinary friends. Those may be very intense. You may have a David and Jonathan relationship with a particular friend. It might be more intense than your marriage. But it's not a marriage. Not because it's not real intense, but because it's not founded upon the kind of bodily unity made possible by sexual reproductive complementarity. A union of persons precisely because the body is personal, part of the personal reality of the human being, and not a sub-personal instrument. Okay? Do we have time for anything else, or is that it? That's it. Good. Thank you so much.